Thank you. Um, I lived here for a long time and uh, Race, Forward's, uh, Race Forward started here. Our first office is here in Oakland. And um, I love to get back as often as I can to see my Oakland colleagues and my friends and uh, people like yourselves. So uh, really happy to be here. And I wanna start by just uh, thanking you so much for working in government because Government is our best hope of getting it right as a society. It is, the, it is the end goal of democracy, right? Is having a functional, inclusive, compassionate, equitable government. And I know that working in government, you get it from both ends. You get from the right to all these um, government sucks messages and like get the government out of my wallet and get the government out of my house. and you know, just shrink the government messages. And I also know you get it from the left, um, uh, you know, buried in complaints about the parts of the government that don't work. And so to decide I am a person who is going to work in government and uh, use that position to try to make things better, that takes just a lot of courage and heart and spirit. And I'm really grateful that you are here um, doing that work. Really, truly grateful. Right now in our country, and certainly in California and in Northern California, we're in this moment where um, there is so much agitation and conversation and um, organizing around racial justice that it makes my um, middle-aged heart happy to see it. Um, and it, it gives all of us who are trying to bring communities together and trying to be a functional society, it gives all of us a tremendous opening and lots of opportunity because now suddenly um, it's like the nation has discovered that racism can appear in a system and not just in an individual. And, um, that history makes some difference to how different communities uh, get through life and, and what they're facing, what they have to deal with. And, um, but with that opportunity also comes lots of backlash and lots of urgency and lots of accusations of uh, political correctness and um, you know, divisiveness and ineffectiveness. So, so I hope that what I'm gonna say today is um, our ideas and principles and things to do that will help sustain you in your effort to make racial equity in the different ge ge geographic places you're in and um, the different kinds of issue areas you work in. I know that doing that work is not simple or easy. And part of what makes it so complicated and so fraught, you know, so like conflicted and uh, uh, conflict producing is that there is, um, it's really hard to match up the two ideas. One, that race is not a real thing, that it has no biological or scientific grounding, uh, that there is in fact only a human race and, um, and there's really no um, inherent difference between people like me and Dwayne. <laughs> yes, Dwayne is much smarter. Um, <coughs> but, um, but even though race isn't real, the reason we're all here in the room is that we know racism is. Racial discrimination is real. The creation of racial hierarchies is real. And it's so real that it actually um, determines how someone's life is going to go, whether they get to uh, graduate from high school and whether they get a living wage job and whether they, uh, when they're sick, they can actually get care that will heal them and that will care and time that will heal them. And so I think for lots of Americans, it's very difficult. They just can't wrap their heads around both of those ideas at the same time. But you have already made that leap. And now uh, the question is, how do you um, act on the racial discrimination part of it without reinforcing some um, inherent difference between human beings? So I'm just gonna share four things that I have found helpful in the course of my 
uh, adult life working on these issues. And the very first of them is that being explicit and being able to have real talk grounded talk, honest talk about racism and racial discrimination and bias is uh, absolutely critical. Without that ability to say what we mean, to name the problems that we want to solve, to uh, avoid using proxy words like disadvantaged and um, vulnerable and at risk and inner city, uh, without using those proxy words and actually talking about the communities we want to address and want to be talking about and want to be um, crafting policy and practice to help, that uh, if, if we're not prepared to talk in real terms like that, we're not going to solve a problem. You can't solve a problem that nobody is willing to name. And so um, I realize that particularly in, in lots of government agencies and in the process of creating policy, there are in fact many, many proxies and code words that we use and that they've become really built into the culture of some of your agencies and that working against that is going to be really challenging. But it will get easier if you keep exercising the muscle and the muscle will become collective if um, people like yourselves bring it into the um, entities, the institutions that you're, that you're in. And it's really important to do that for three reasons. One is that if we can be explicit that way, we can also reveal to people the mechanisms of that discrimination, many of which don't have intentional racial bias behind them, right? So you, uh, most Americans define racism as individual, intentional, and overt. And so if you're not you know, throwing racial slurs around or hanging a noose somewhere, sometimes even if there is a noose hanging, um, <clears throat> Americans uh, only recognize the most overt, most obvious forms of racism as actual racism. So when you, when you talk about race explicitly and you, you use that lens to look at how your institution actually gets its work done, then you have a chance to reveal what those mechanisms of discrimination are. So you can reveal that, oh, when we are um, giving out building citations on code enforcement because you know, 60 years ago, somebody passed a law that said all the roofs in our community have to be the same color. When we give out citations because your roof is the wrong color uh, to a set of people who cannot afford to pay the citation nor replace their roofs, um, that, and oh, that turns out to be uh, all people of color, then you can see how what seems like a race neutral, fairly benign, you know, it would just make our community prettier if all the roofs were the same color kind of law ends up having a discriminatory effect and um, making certain people, um, yeah, having a dis discriminatory effect. So being able to reveal the actual mechanisms by which discrimination takes place, even if it's especially the unintentional kinds of discrimination, the kinds that are just kind of baked into our systems because we're not accounting for the different needs of communities, that's a really important benefit of being explicit. Second benefit is that you find the people who are with you when you say racial equity. Um, you find other people who are interested in racial equity. If you don't say it, then they don't know to come find you. Um, and they won't come find you and you'll be alone, um, not saying racial equity, but trying to achieve it nonetheless. Uh, one of the stories I really love is um, about my friend Pramila Jayapal, who is a state senator in Washington state. She's the first uh, South Asian state senator, certainly in Washington and possibly um, nationally. So she, one of the earliest things she did when she got in office was begin working on changing racist names of parks and uh, monuments and like public spaces. So her first effort was to change the name of Coon Lake, which she did successfully. And then she started a kind of a program to, to change all the uh, racist names. And in the course of that, she got a letter from a white kayak tour leader. So a white guy who leads tourists from around the world 
um, through Washington's uh, rivers, and um, who is deeply embarrassed every time he takes a tour of people through Jim Crow Park. Jim Crow Park. Um, when Pramila was attempting to change the name of Jim Crow Park, somebody told her, oh, but Jim Crow was a person and he's no longer with us and we have to honor him. Um, Jim Crow isn't a person, never was a person. Just an idea, a deeply segregationist, um, racist, offensive idea. So, so that, ki that kayak leader, you know, if Pramila hadn't been willing to say, these are racist names and they don't belong in 21st century Washington state, he would never have, she would never have found that, that guy and he would never have found her. So, um, so you find allies and people who are with you if you're, if you're out, upfront about it. And then finally, I think a really important idea is that racial justice makes things better for everybody and maybe not actually everybody because somebody is probably gonna have a little less freedom to discriminate because we've achieved racial justice, but it will make things better for vulnerable white people. And I think that that's an argument we don't make often enough and it's one of the ways in which racial justice is unifying, talking about race is unifying. I was um, really horrified a few weeks ago, I read a story in the New York Times about a white man who was having a psychotic break in Georgia. He was in the car with his girlfriend. His girlfriend called the police, they arrived, and um, they tased him to death. They tased him for 20 minutes after he said, I quit, after he, his body went limp, he was passive, um, and he said, I quit, I'm dead, and they just kept tasing him, and in, indeed, he did die. And, um, in the New York Times story, it said there was no racial dimension here because the victim was white and the cops were also white, but there was a racial dimension because policing is built on um, the purpose of policing communities of color. So the use of force policies and the training of police officers and the um, attitude that we have toward uh, people who need help is so deeply racialized and so part of policing culture that then um, it doesn't, uh, you know, a white mentally ill man can in fact then be treated in that case, not as white, uh, not as other white men might be treated, but as um, other weak people, other unwanted people, other people who need to be controlled would be treated and those are people of color. So racial justice and real talk about it can actually be unifying, but we have to like, um, we have to practice and try different things and figure out what the, what the points of unity really are, particularly with vulnerable white communities. So even if you do all of that, you know, you get really, really great at talking about race and most of the time you're super compelling about it and you have, you have language that everybody can understand and so on, there will still be a backlash. There will always be a backlash. Backlash is part of the process of achieving justice in any arena and that is no less true for race than anything else. And you can't avoid the backlash or avoid attacks simply by trying to use the proxy words and, and hide it. So you have to prepare for it and, um, and get yourselves ready as teams to address it. And I found three things that really help with that. The first one is to focus much more on impact than we do on intention. So if the conventional, um, and even to a large degree, the legal definition of racism requires intention and um, you know, wanting to discriminate and really overt expressions of discrimination, um, it's really, really difficult to prove that such intention exists. So, uh, this is the entire origin of the, some of my best friends are black joke, right? Because uh, you, somebody says, well, you know, that's racist, you're racist, and the person who has been accused, you know, pulls up somebody, um, often somebody in their own families, and says, well, I can't be racist because look, here's my, here's my friend, my wife, my kid, my niece, my best friend. So. Um, so intention is not good ground for us. We can't get very far if that is um, core to our definition of racial 
discrimination, impact is a much, much, much better ground because impact can be proven. Impact can be proven with data and it can be proven with stories and it can be proven with uh, revealing people's actual experiences of systems and, um, and of other people, their experience with other people. And you can, you can deal with impact systematically through something like a racial equity impact assessment. That's a tool that we use at Race Forward. We have our own version of it. But cities across the countries, across the country that are uh, part of GARE have adapted it and come up with their own questions and their own ways of um, conducting such analysis. But it basically works like an environmental impact assessment, right? If you're going to put up a building, you'd have to account for all kinds of things before you'd be allowed to put it up. What's the effect going to be on the water, the air, the soil, the uh, noise, the traffic, etc.? And if those impacts were uh, turned out to be negative, then you might not get to put the building up or you might have to really change your building plan or the architecture of it in order to get it up. And it's so much easier to figure that out before the building goes up and to make changes than to figure it out after the building goes up and to be trying to remediate those things. So a racial equity impact assessment does the same thing and you can apply it to decisions large and small to legislation and regulation and practice. So it doesn't have to just be uh, applied to, you know, particular written down policies. Uh, it can be applied to the way that you um, figure out the way that you get public comment, for example, and the way you do outreach to communities and um, the way you return phone calls uh, uh, even. So that the, the goal is to equip ourselves as teams, as collectives and as institutions to do equity conscious decision making and to replace that, uh, replace color blindness with that equity consciousness. Because uh, color blindness comes out of the wrong definition of racism, right? It comes out of um, uh, an understanding that there's no biological reality to race, but not understanding that discrimination exists nonetheless. So color blindness, if if there's no biological reality, then it makes sense. Colorblind, I can just not see race. Let me just not see it. But of course, uh, racism is a social construct. It's not a biological construct. And uh, you have to have ways to take it apart and dig into it. So focusing on impact is, is the way to do that. And there are lots of tools available to help with that. The second thing I have found important to do is to talk about our racial equity goals and our desires, our commitments to that as a matter of strategy as well as being a matter of morality. So I definitely believe that um, fighting discrimination is the right thing to do. I certainly believe it makes my heart hurt when I think about the millions of people in our country who um, have all kinds of brilliance that we will never get to benefit from because uh, it just, nobody's looking for it and people assume it's not gonna be there and institutions treat them accordingly. That, that kills me uh, at, at my soul level. Um, and I also understand that our institutions exist to do something in the world. Your institutions, government, it exists to get people fed or get them through school or make sure they're healthy or get them food or you know plan transportation lines across your city or county or uh, whatever your geography is. So there is an actual mission and purpose and set of goals that your institutions purport to have and racial equity decision making is key to making those things happen as well as key to being uh, feeling good about yourselves. And if you are able to make strategic arguments about why to uh, embrace and adopt a racial equity lens, uh, you will not be in the position of arguing that your colleagues who, who haven't gotten there yet are not moral people. You'll just be in the position of arguing that we're not making good strategic decisions, uh, which is hard enough in itself. I'm not saying they're gonna like love that, 
but they're um, but getting past the initial defensiveness that people any human being would have if you told them you're being not a good person right now is part of um, having an actual strategy for moving racial equity ideas along so strategy as well as morality and then my final lesson really is to when we're thinking about how to operationalize these ideas to do that in as close association and relationship with community as you can. Uh, there are so many good reasons for that, one of them being that the community is who you're uh, trying to serve, right? And if something isn't working for them, they have to have a way to let you know that, or you have to have a way to elicit that information. And together, you have to be uh, able to determine whether or not your institutions are hitting the kinds of outcomes that you want to have, the kinds of impact that you want to have. In no other arena would we say good intention was enough. You know, if BP caused an oil spill and didn't clean it up and then said, oh, but we didn't mean to like spill that oil, we would never think that was a good enough answer. So intention, um, uh, has to impact, sorry, impact has to be clear and our desired impact has to be clear. And that desired impact is best worked out with the community so that you don't end up in a situation where as an institution you've said, oh, these different impacts are good enough for us to aim for and you start pursuing that heavily when the community knows that an entirely other thing is what's really required. Um, and you just end up talking at cross purposes across each other. So, so those are my tips, you know, build your muscle for talking real talk and being explicit. The more you do it, the more everybody else in your institution is gonna get used to it and um, less freaked out by it. Then focus on impact a lot more than we do on intention. Be, talk in terms of strategy as well as morality. And uh, as you're operationalizing these ideas, really try to be like this, like this, like this with your community so that um, you can course correct along the way, so that you can set the right sets of goals, and so that you can um, get real true feedback that will help you do your work better. Um, Race Forward is here for you as you do that. Gare is definitely here for you. We work together very closely and all the time. And I know that you can do it. I know you have the um, strength. I know you have the brains. I know you have the peer support. Um, and I know that you can do it. And this is the time where we have an opening to establish racial equity in governance at a rate and a pace that we haven't had uh, this kind of opportunity in about 50 years. So I know you can do it, and I hope that you will do it. Thank you. So everyone here is a part of the community, including the team members from the care jurisdictions. But if you're not with one of the jurisdictions I listed, and you're just a community member who came because you're interested and committed to these issues, can you raise your hand? This is the only community guests we have today, so a few. Um, I'm struck at the end, you talk about the partnership between community and government. You've done this work now for three decades. Say a bit about the, the arc of your perspective on where government fits as a community advocate, where you start and where you are now. And I, I, I remember the image, we were in Los Angeles yesterday having this conversation, and you mentioned maybe inadvertently or chasing down a, a government official right. at one point. So. Right. I mean, my, my early training is as an organizer and um, as a direct action, membership-based community organizer. And our, you know, in my earlier days, my feeling was government was only ever a target. It, was, it could never really be an ally. And certainly I didn't own it. There wasn't, there, it wasn't my government. Um, but. I said earlier that government is the end goal of democracy, and I think um, I think that 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 idea is what has really become crystallized in my mind over this period, over you know the the decades I've been doing the work, and that we own government, community owns government, and uh, which part of the community gets to exercise 
control over government varies from place to place and definitely money of course has a lot to do with it but but government i think actually is our best hope of achieving some of the kinds of outcomes we want i don't think that the private sector is going to set up a um, system of privately funded education that is going to benefit all kids and i think it i think government has to do that it's our only hope for doing that um, making sure that every kid has access to a quality education. So when I was younger though, um, you know, government was always our target or our opponent and, um, and the chasing somebody down the, down the street story was, I, one of the earliest uh, organizing campaigns that I ever worked on was a campaign to shut down a welfare hotel in San Francisco. This is 1988 or 89, I think it was 88. And um, uh, we, were, we wanted a new health inspection done of the building, which was basically a slum and should never have passed a health inspection in the first place. And so we went to, we made an appointment with the then director of uh, public health in San Francisco. And when we got to his office, he wasn't there. And they gave us, you know, had us talk to an aide. But we had someone planted in the lobby, and as we came out of the elevator after you know talking to the wrong person, um, at the elevator doors opened, and our colleague said he just left the building. So we ran, and you know, kids, TV cameras, uh, everybody in tow. We ran, and we caught up to him after a block and a half, and we got a new health inspection. Um, but now they're, you know. So I think one important thing being in government that you can do is really support that kind of community organizing. Speak up for it, defend it. Um, it can be upsetting to be the target of, of a protest or organizing, I understand that. Um, but you, you know, thick skin makes good allies <laughs> is my feeling. So, um, so helping, all of your colleagues kind of process whatever feelings they might have um, when protests happen or when the community organizes, that's a really important role, I think, for government. And I think um, community and government can be allies to each other. And, but being allies to each other doesn't mean you never have conflict um, or that you don't have different strategies for um, getting your point across. So one of the themes that's come up a lot as far as over the course of the year so far, as well as the complexity of this issue. And I don't know if you have any advice for government workers who are trying to deal with race and all the many ways in which that plays out. How do you keep a, a pathway to the success rate? Well, like anything else, it's um, like any other giant problem that is fundamental to the way that um, we all relate to each other and fundamental to our history and, and trajectory as a society, you have to break it down into smaller and smaller pieces. And you want to try to rack up some early successes so that you can get a, a growing mandate. So I find a lot of times when people do this work, they, they have this very broad um, notion of what the problem is and it is broad and it is complex i'm not saying you know make it fakely narrow but within any big problem there are smaller problems embedded and the trick is to right size the next intervention you're going to do to what the history of your institution has been to what your leadership is um, able to accommodate and you know support uh, to what the community is demanding. So there are all these different factors that give you more or less space to move. And you weigh those factors and you try to crap, carve out something that is meaningful but not the whole. Something that might be small but is still meaningful. And then really make a granular work plan like anything else. If there isn't a person and a deadline attached to it, it's not getting done. And so, um, so right size the initial project. And once you've accomplished that, right size the next project. And 
um, be really granular and detailed about the work planning around it. Um, that's not my thing, the work planning and details. I like, I just lose all interest to be completely frank. Um, but that is why I don't, um, that's why I build teams and that's why I, um, I raise money so that I can pay people who have those skills um, and I don't have to like self-improve uh, in order to get there. Uh. But also I think that reinforces the metaphor you used earlier about building muscles. Right. You can start with the exercises you can manage and right. strengthen those as well. A tension we've been dealing with too is pace as we kind of pull the curtain back on all the systemic issues that are part of racial inequity. There's an anxiousness that comes both from within and also from without to move quickly, move everything. And yet we also know you have to build this momentum. Any thoughts on how you maintain that balance of the urgency but also the long game? Yeah, I think you have to keep talking about the long game and whatever piece of work you've carved out, you have to keep relating it to what the long game is gonna be. So for example, if your goal is to transform the nature of policing in your community, um, to have the police and um, we were just, Julie and I were talking about probation officers and what their job is. So let's say your goal was to um, really fundamentally shift the way that policing happened and what police officers thought their job was in a community. Um, and you decided, okay, we're gonna start by hiring more officers from the community that we're looking to police. You have to be able to actually think through what is, what is the connection between hiring different police officers and that foundational change that you've said is your long-term goal. And, um, you know, people will say, oh, it doesn't matter if you hire officers of color or it's all about hiring officers of color. People will stake out positions on, on both ends of that. But your job, if that, if that is the work you're doing, is to really think through, well, um, if we hire new officers of color, then um, how can we train them differently in order to get to that foundational change? Um, yeah, so I, I think, um, Part of what happens to us is that, or when we're doing the work is, we have these big goals in mind and fundamental, really massive changes, often changes in the culture of an institution, but the first thing that is available for us to do is much, much smaller. How you do that smaller thing determines whether or not you'll be able to stack up smaller things to get to that bigger fundamental change or not. Um, so you can hire new police officers of color in ways that move toward that foundational change or in ways that don't. Um, and that's, that's the um, strategic challenge of planning out our projects on the front end. So even basically transactional encounters have to be transformational in their approach if you want to get to transformation over the long yeah, like, you know, a, a different arena where I talk about this is in um, multiracial coalitions or alliance building and movement building. So I believe in uh, monoracial spaces. So I believe, like, if black people want to have an organization, they should have an organization. If Indian immigrants need an organization, they should have an organization. But if we intend for that black organization and that Indian American organization to work together in the same movement at some point, you build those, um, you build those organizations differently than if you don't ever imagine them working together. Um, it changes the way you recruit people, maybe the mission of the organization, maybe the way you do political or community education, maybe the kinds of campaigns you decide to work on. So it's the same thing. Um, here where, um, yeah, if you, in the way that you talk about um, how, I'm trying to think of a, like, what feels like a very neutral example, but let's say that you wanted to change the public notice system for getting, for like town hall meetings and getting public comment on things. And the change is very small. It's like, instead of burying an announcement 
printed in English on page 56 of the daily newspaper. We're going to use social media. We're going to do it in different languages. We're going to you know, do all these different things. I mean, those are important to do, but they're still relatively small. Um, and, but you can use that process to educate so many people about the public comment, uh, you know, about democracy. That's democracy, right? And you can use that process to get your own institution starting to get accustomed to equity, racial equity conscious decision making. Um, or not. If you want those outcomes, you have to sort of build them into the way that you talk about um, even the change you're going to make around announcing public comment opportunities. I have 10 more questions. <laughs> but I'm only going to ask two. And then we're going to turn them over to you guys. The first is you, you talk about community for a second. Just say a little bit about your evolution in terms of what, what a sophisticated approach is that government can take to engage community more effectively, than, given the moment we're in now. Yeah. You know, we've been involved in this process in Salinas, California for about two years now, um, almost two years, that I've learned so much from. So Salinas is a city of 160,000 people, and they had, between um, December of 2014 and June of 2015, they had four officer-involved fatal shootings of men of color. And um, there had been lots of churn and organizing in that community for years, you know, around policing and other things as well. But that, that concentration of deadly shootings had generated so much churn. And um, we uh, worked with lots of different groups, advocacy groups locally, community organizations locally, and the city government um, through a process that has been supported by the California Endowment and that got us with our structural equity curriculum. You know, we teach people how to like make racial equity in institutions of all kinds. And um, we worked with the National Compadres Network, which is a social psychological organization that works on trauma and healing and um, changing community norms and practice around domestic and sexual violence in particular. And um, so br I think it was pretty sophisticated to bring this essentially psychological framework and political structural framework together. And what we found is that um, we were, through a process, able to get the community and the city government in Salinas to actually agree on a set of definitions. What, what constitutes racial discrimination? Is it only that intentional, overt, and um, conscious kind, or individual kind, or is there something called implicit bias? Is there something, um, is there a thing where you can have race neutral laws and policies but still have terrible racial effects? So um, in, in Salinas, they've been crafting a joint agenda really grounded by the city government, led by the city manager who has been the most consistent champion of this work that I've ever seen. And um, in under two years, they've got actual changes going in three of their departments in particular. Public works, which, you know, that's like physical layout and um, how the city actually looks and runs. Um, poli the police department and in their libraries and recreation, that's what they call their parks and rec division. So, um, so I think a joint process requires some sophistication and it requires real emotional wherewithal for everybody involved. At the beginning of that process in Salinas, we did two days of training for the advocates and two days of training for the city staff and they were all nervous, they were all anxious, none of them wanted to be with the other people. They were like, oh, we're just going to get reamed basically is what they thought and and um, and on the fit on a fifth day we brought them all together and I think just having the experience of being able to talk to each other using the same language and not talking over each other um, was 
it created the foundation for real ongoing um, democracy in a, and equity conscious decision making um, from the residents all the way through to the city manager. So the last question I have before we turn to the audience is uh, often we see the teams wrestling with how perfect does the strategy need to be to, to, to launch? Can it be good enough or does it have to be perfect and how do we make that kind of decision? Especially with the responsibility you carry as government. Um, it can be good enough, but good enough had best be a lot better than what was before. <laughs> yes, that would that would be that so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect, and honestly, we don't know enough about how to do this for it to be perfect. Like, there's nobody who's gotten it perfectly right that you could just rip their model and like. A, lay it on top of your institution and be there. So perfection is, it's impossible. So having, having perfection as a goal means that you won't do anything. So that's not good. Um, but good enough, you know, you have to be able to answer good enough for whom? So good enough for you because you can manage to like get it done or good enough for the community as a, as an early effort, as a found, you know, foundation laying thing. Um, and, and yeah, good enough had better be a lot better than what you're not doing anymore. So is it better than before? That's a, sta a criteria. Is it connected to bigger foundational, more foundational change? That's a criteria, even if it's small. Um, and is it, is it helping to build muscle and support for racial equity um, in the institutions and in the community at large? That's a criteria. If you've got an idea that does those three things, then um, it's probably worth going for it. Great, thanks. I think uh, in addition to being an amazing strategist and community leader herself, Julie Nelson, the director of GEAR, is a able handler of the mic, and so she's going to uh, bring the mic around to you for questions from the audience. Don't go outside, because I might ask a question. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, wearing your hat as an outsider, tell us your strategy, uh, your, your thinking in terms of the strategy of when you sue or when do you file a complaint with the feds? And as, as government folks, we, kn we know that the danger of, of uh, risking the loss of federal funds is always a very powerful incentive. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm not a lawyer, but I have uh, worked with lots of lawyers in the course of organizing. And um, I think that there are a lot of good reasons to sue. The number one reason, of course, is if you think that a lawsuit will actually get recourse, will actually you know, move the resources that you need to move. So that's you know, the, the possibility of making ac getting actual material change, that's, that's a good reason to sue. Um, I, it, you sue if the leverage is real, like if, if and actually, so you threaten to sue um, to, for leverage, but you have to be willing to follow through if you're going to threaten. And um, one thing to keep in mind is, but sometimes lawsuits are not much of a threat and they aren't um, leverage because uh, municipalities just build them into the cost of doing business. So this is the problem, for example, with the way we try to get recourse on, on bad policing and um, um, you know, excessive use of force or discriminatory use of force and things like that. Uh, you may know that very, very few police officers have ever been indicted or convicted of manslaughter or murder for um, killing a person of color, and yet those uh, in those same cases when there are civil 
judgments, so, so police officer is not indicted, um, often no charges even are considered, um, family sues in the civil courts and wins often millions, millions of dollars. Um, so that happens again and again and again. It's been going on for 40, 50 years. Um, but that, those millions of dollars in losses have not, in fact, deterred police departments from, uh, or you know, generated new behavior, new policies and practices within police departments. They just kind of build it into what's going to happen. So, so in that case, a lawsuit isn't, um, those kinds of civil suits in particular don't really act as leverage. Um, and, um, you know, a family should, I'm not saying families shouldn't sue, but, uh, but they don't serve the same purpose as like um, a civil rights lawsuit around desegregation of housing or schools or something like that. Um, and then the other thing, the last thing to consider is what the organizing um, atmosphere is. And I, I think lawsuits have very limited effects, even if they are successful, if there isn't community and government organized to um, implement whatever, whatever remedies have been mandated uh, out of a lawsuit. Got another question back here. Yeah, I wanted to just say I appreciate the work you did in, in Salinas of bringing the community advocates together and then the government agencies together and then figuring out how to bridge that gap. And I'm curious if you could say a little bit more about what worked to make that effective. Both, was it just spending the time or were there specific things you did that worked? I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, I so a couple of things that made it work definitely leadership from both sets of people and really really um, really brave and consistent leadership so the city manager Ray Corpus has uh, he insisted that every single department participate in the training multiple people from it, each department um, <clears throat> he did not wait for a mandate from the city council to do it. He just did it. Um, so that was one thing. I think the, on, on a different note, just acknowledging that people were, uh, people on both sides, the, among the residents, residents, advocates, and city staffers, um, had suffered and um, experienced some trauma and needed healing, that acknowledgement um, seemed pretty key. Um, I think actually the training team, just time, because we, the, the first effort, in the first effort we did everything within a week, this concentrated period of time, um, People got to see the training team multiple times be comfortable and easy and optimistic about the whole topic. And, um, and that set a tone that was um, a tone of togetherness, I guess. Um, and you know, we did some creative things on the fifth day when, when we all came together. We incorporated a couple of games into the the agenda for that day because we wanted people to have a physical experience of working together, a, a somatic experience of that. Um, we incorporate, uh, the National Compadres Network is all about storytelling, so lots and lots of stories got told in the course of that week. Um, those were some of the factors. And then in the end, granular work planning. You know, pick a project, make a work plan, do it. Oh, we did it. Something actually happened. People have so much cynicism and fatalism about questions of race. They really think that nothing will ever change, that we're just all, we've got these biases in our heads and, you know, the best you can do is mitigate some of the drama and the harm. So um, it's been very important to have early small um, projects happen there. And there was a period in Salinas where that was held up. 
uh, the logistics just didn't come together. And let me just say now, logistical problems quickly become political problems. So don't let logistics become the holdup, like the fact that, oh, we just for, we didn't make complete the work plan and therefore these five things didn't get a person ass assigned to them and didn't get a deadline assigned to them. That our, um, there are like easy and hard ways to schedule meetings. Meeting scheduling becomes like this huge problem. Am I lying? I think, <laughs> right. So um, efficiency in meeting scheduling and thinking about w how we use meetings and um, you know, does every meeting have to last an hour? No, some of them can go 15 minutes or even making a meeting for 45 minutes instead of an hour. Um, I know people who do all their meetings standing up because it makes your like long talkers like talk a lot less. Um, so creativity uh, on that front, but logistical problems quickly amount to, well, they never really wanted to do it anyway. Um, and so that's, that's an arena of vigilance for, for people like yourselves. You talked about um, creating a growing mandate. And it seems to me that in a lot of the institutions, <coughs> governmental institutions, there's always sort of like this benevolent leader, leadership within a department, et cetera. What happens when there is no leadership in that arena, but most of the leadership is actually coming out of line staff? And unfortunately, you don't get in trouble for you know making mistakes. You get in trouble for moving outside of your role. Yeah. And so I'm wondering. How do you create that a growing mandate without quote of benevolent sort of yeah. leader? Well, I guess I would say that's where an inside outside um, strategy would really be important because if if the people who are inside have limitations on what they can push forward on, then they need some kind of leverage uh, to justify stepping out of their roles or expanding their roles or um, you know, making some other department take up something that isn't in your role. Um, so that's when you need the organizing and the community demand to be there. And, um, and so that's a reason to like really, really support that kind of direct action organizing. So, I mean, in Salinas, there's a case study about our work in Salinas that you can find on our website at raceforward.org. But there was a thing that happened about nine months after we did all this training and got the process started on the anniversary of what they call um, of an uprising that was happening at the height of these police shootings. On the anniversary, there was a new uh, round of protests, right? as you would expect, any, any community-minded person would expect that. And, um, and, but by then, the city staff had already been in this process where you know, community and staff were together and, and, and they were really taken aback by the anniversary protests. They were like, why are they protesting us still? We like, didn't we work it all out last November? And, um, and they kind of had to like get used to the idea that there's gonna be protest. And, and even if there is, it's still your job and still your mandate to work very, very closely with these very same community leaders who, um, yes indeed, they did support those protests that were so upsetting to you. So people like yourselves, can you can help your colleagues process their feelings about that. It's okay to have feelings, I, I understand that. Um, and I understood the feelings of the city staffers in Salinas. And um, that's why we need the emotional strength to do this work and why we have to pay some attention to the trauma and healing and psychology of it all um, and incorporate understanding those things into our strategy. So in um, thinking about your comment that you made about the, the roof enforcement or the code enforcement person, um, you know, uh, the code enforcement person's job is to go out there, identify these violations, write up the citations, and hand them off, and she does her job well. Um, so in thinking about that, um, 
I'm kind of wondering what are the structures that jurisdictions should have in place to kind of keep their finger on the pulse of racial equity? Because in some ways, you're almost like relying on the community to bring up these issues because you're so right. ingrained in your day-to-day -day work and you're trying to do what you've been told to do in the best way possible. Yeah. Well, um, having a consistent practice of applying a racial equity impact assessment, uh, I mentioned doing it for small and large things. So um, that kind of thing can be built into, like if you looked at code enforcement and citations for, um, I mean, I use the roof example because I know that, but uh, what's another thing that gets code enforced? like abandoned cars and that are sitting on the street, right? Okay, so um, if you just did, had the requirement of a monthly or semi-annual or even an annual racial, racialized data gathering around where car citations were going out and, um, and then you could see whether there was a pattern of more citations in particular places and it might even be because in those places there simply are more abandoned cars because people can't afford to get them fixed or you know whatever the case might be, have nowhere else to store them. Then um, once you saw the pattern, the next question would be, um, so this is a racially um, alarming pattern and um, but we don't necessarily want abandoned cars out on the street what's a different solution that might, um, that might work? And I guess a question that would come up for me in a, an example like that is, is giving out these citations actually getting the cars off the street? Um, or are citations just piling up and then the consequences of having multiple ci citations also piling up on a particular family of color? So um, the racial equity impact assessment leads you through, ours leads you through 10 questions uh, that you could apply to anything, where we have our uh, monthly staff meeting all the way to a piece of statewide legislation that you're examining. Um, but getting into the habit of asking about the racial impact of our practices uh, will start to reveal things that um, look not right and reveal and start getting people to um, focus on the need for alternatives. Hi, thank Hi. you. Um, I'm going way back. All right. Big steps, back to the beginning. Okay. <laughs> but um, what resources other than, like we have uh, Gary here and uh, your organization, to even begin to develop the skills to have those discussions? What resources have you used to either train staff that you used yourself in your 30 years to be prepared? Because to have these types of discussions with our elected electeds and with our wider community, I think ours, maybe many other jurisdictions, well, we need to really develop those skills ourselves. Mm -hmm. And just any input, tips, resources sure. you have would be great. Yeah. Um, there's a website called Racial Equity Tools that regularly um, compiles tools that people like us are creating around the country, some of them quite regionally and locally uh, oriented. Uh, we also use a lot of articles and pop culture, videos, music, things like that in our teaching. and. Um, uh, so, a couple of people I would point to, there's um, a guy named Jay Smooth. People know Jay Smooth? He's, he, more people um, on the East Coast know him than out West, but uh, Jay Smooth is actually, a, he's a DJ, a hip hop historian, a music critic, and um, he does these very um, accessible videos about different issues, most of them raced, though they're like two minutes long, they're very um, fun to watch. He uses the language that um, people who are not academics use, um, <laughs> and, and, and they're very like, um, 
they're just sharp, you know, he'll just like drill down into something and break it down in two minutes and do it in a way that is really entertaining. So we, his stuff, um, the comedy of uh, Kamau Bell, Hari Kondabolu, um, there's, a, there's a guy out of Australia, Ram, Ram, uh, I think his name is Rob, I can't remember his name, anyway. Um, <laughs> If you, if you look at Color Lines, which is the daily news site that we produce, we, have a, we cover culture, and a lot of that culture is artists of color and comedians and entertainers of color who are doing different things. So that's a good resource when you just, like, you need something to spark a conversation without, like, getting up and doing a stand-up comedy routine for your colleagues. Um, I think those are good. Also, a site called Racialicious has, has things like that. I think you want to use the news and pop culture and the things that are happening in the community as much as possible. So it's not all a big abstraction, you know. Oh, another great resource is this site called Everyday Feminism, where they do really, really um, accessible, broken down lists of things. So it's like, five reasons why um, you know, lemonade is not for white ladies, or, um, uh, I mean, I made that one up. They didn't, <laughs> that wasn't an actual thing. <laughs> and I'm not even saying lemonade is not for white ladies, but, um, uh, so everyday feminism, I would check those out, check those we out. We do one thing that, um, just to give you guys a heads up, <laughs> It's in August that we will be doing a train the trainer that you'll have at the August session. You'll have a choice of breakout sessions. Um, and when it comes to changing your organizational culture, training is a key part of it. And so we will give you a curriculum that you can use with your colleagues, with your <laughs> elected officials, wide range of different people. Part of it will be walking you through the curriculum. Part of it will be practicing the curriculum and talking about facilitation tips. And want to be really clear that one of the reasons why we love Train the Trainer is that in doing that, you build your own skill and build your own capacity. Um, in training the entire breadth of an organization, you will have a much better sense of the opportunities from a programmatic perspective, from a policy perspective. So it's not just about providing information, it's actually about changing the organization as well. So that's August. Did I get that right? Wait. Okay, thank you. We have time for, how are we doing on time? We're going to get about 12 minutes. Okay. When you first started speaking, can you say how we use names such as vulnerable communities, sometimes you say underserved, unserved. What, what language should we be using? If you could give some examples. Um, Latinos, <laughs> Cambodian immigrants. Um, yeah, inner city is one of the codes that really makes me laugh nowadays because there are no people of color in most inner cities. They've been redeveloped out. So, um, so yeah, just to actually name the community and, um, yeah. And I, I think that sometimes there are terms of art that can begin to get at a picture, but if you don't drive to the point you're trying to make with that picture, it's well, you fall start. It's like you never use the term underserved again. Our Latino communities that are under right, served. of course. But if yes, you don't exactly. explicitly say why you're talking about that community as being underserved, then we can miss it and right. that makes problem. Right. right, you can take a both and approach to it. And one other comment I think on that in our last year conference was that whatever you're calling community, if you lead with people who are yes. people who have or something like that, then it, it personalizes it, and it's not just that. Like people of Latino descent, or, um, yeah, people who identify as. I wonder, though, don't you run the risk of leaving out certain communities if you try to name some, that, but you haven't captured all of them? And then, in a sense, you know, that, that does a disservice to those populations you haven't explicitly. 
Well, if they're not part of your, if they're not part of the effort that you're trying to move, then there's no need to name them because you're actually trying to target a particular group of people. But yeah. They cover a whole broad Yeah, but it usually actually doesn't. <laughs> Underserved usually really, we use it as a, it may cover a range of populations. And if it does, then you can just say it covers a range of populations. Um, or you can, or you can, in fact, list them all. Um, certainly online, you can do that. If not in speech, um, and in in writing, you can do that. But I, what I want to point to is the um, the futility of using universal and all, and hoping that all will actually see themselves in it. So in our country, we are at the you know 270 or. 240 years out, wait, yes, right? 240 years out from, um, from, let me just think about the right way to say this, where for centuries, the um, impression and the established identity of an American has been of a white person. And so the universal, the default universal, the default all is white. And um, so if you want to reach people of color, um, all is not going to get you there. I'll give you a quick example. There was years ago before the Affordable Care Act passed, when it was still being debated, I went to a gathering here in the Bay Area with a couple of uh, maybe 500 people and a man came up onto the stage and he made an argument for the Affordable Care Act before it passed. And he said, uninsured people are just like you and me. They're white, they're employed, they're et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's an example of how we unthinkingly use um, just like you and me and the assumption of who's in the universal and who's in the all. And so I think it's, this is a tough one for white folks. I, get, I understand it because, because there is a, oops, sorry, there is a, um, you know, a gut level kind of clarity or a gut level notion that all, you know, when I say all, I mean all, I'm including everybody. But the, the actual historical experiences of people of color have been, has been that policies that were about the all left us out. Another, a good example of that is that when the Social Security Act was created in the 1940s, 1930s actually, um, it explicitly left out farm workers and domestic workers from being able to access Social Security. Um, Social Security was an enormous benefit. It is the way, it is the thing that got old people, elders, out of poverty that didn't have people sort of living out their entire, you know, the last part of their life in total poverty, abject poverty. But um, domestic workers and farm workers were excluded. Who were domestic workers and farm workers at the time? They were black people and Latinos and Asians and native people. And so Social Security was a supposedly universal program that applied to all. And yet, um, you know, this one little regulation cut out millions of people. And that's the history that people of color and communities of color have lived and understand. And that's why when we hear all, we're cynical about that. And we need to see ourselves listed in order to believe that we got considered in the all. Um, so the, the a good way to think about it, uh, about policy making in this arena is to aim for targeted universalism. We want universal goals. We want everybody to have social security. We don't want any elders to be living in poverty without any support. And um, we're going to target our strategies toward different communities specifically because we know they're entering old age in or elderhood. Um, I'm trying to like stop using <laughs> the word old because like what else do you say? So yeah, um, childhood, elderhood. So um, uh, uh, we know that the different conditions that 
uh, different communities enter elderhood with really determine the quality of their lives and 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 his maybe at some point we'll get to a place in this country where all really does mean all but to date all has not meant all and and that's why we um, we tend to insist on explicitness and on actually naming communities. And if it means you have to name 30 different communities, then so be it. It's a diverse country. And um, it's better to name them all than to try to use, name them all, than to try to use some kind of universal shorthand that, that won't actually like compute with people. Thank you for asking that question. Really important one. Hi, um, I work for the San Francisco Planning Department, so we deal with development uh, a lot. So um, you talked about working very close with the community, and um, often we find ourselves in, like, in that middle that you described in the beginning. And um, I mean, we have been doing more and more working closely with the community, but it's very, very hard. And I was just wondering if you can or discuss the company. Uh, what, are, exactly. what are some of the things that are hard? Uh, like, is it trust or? It's definitely trust. Trust is definitely a big thing um, that you know, people of lower income or people of color, they don't trust the government. And you know, we have not a good history either. So I give them credit for not trusting us. But at the same time, we get pulled by the development community that, provide all these benefits that came you know, our projects won't work and people who, who don't want project, um, any development in their neighborhood. So we're kind of like in the middle of like working with uh, people with <coughs> lower income of color is harder because of the trust issues and also the money issues. Okay, so there are a couple of things I, I feel like I've seen, um, for example, in Salinas that have made a difference. So one is that, um, City staffers, particular city staffers in Salinas, have a long history of go showing up to community things. So they were known, you know, people, even if um, they weren't born and raised in Salinas, they, at times where there wasn't a crisis, they would go. So the community got used to seeing them and knowing, like, oh, it's not just because they have to come out now, that it's part of their way of being in city government. Um, that was one thing that made a difference. Another thing um, is, oh, what was the other thing? Oh, the other thing I think is when you get input or feedback from the community to respond back to it. So if some of that stuff ended up in your ultimate plan, then show, show people that that happened. If some of it you rejected and didn't include in your ultimate plan, say why you didn't. So it's really frustrating to like turn out to things and give your input because the government says they want it and then never to hear anything back about what happened with that. And um, you know, unless we expect people to like granularly follow your policy and practice changes, they're not gonna know because some of them are gonna be so um, subtle hopefully important, even if subtle, that, you know, the newspaper is not going to report on it. And even if the newspaper did, like, there's a lot of news, so it's easy to miss. So I think um, showing up for community when, especially when it's not crisis time, and um, reporting back on these sort of community engagement times uh, those are two things that really help. We have time for maybe one final question, and I see. I, I'll catch you myself. I have a whole. I know. Have my eye on We get tired. It happens. Um, can you help us to articulate how racial justice makes things better for everybody? For example, um, how do we get the white people in the Oakland Hills to care about African Americans in West Oakland? Or how do you get um, 
white decision maker or white politicians in mostly white communities to get on board with like a city or a countywide racial justice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, if you're trying to get somebody on your program on board and they don't already agree with you, the thing you should not do is throw a bunch of data at them. So, I think a lot of our persuasion mode is let me show you the data and the data is always this disparities data with no explanation of how the disparity came to be. So you have to, your storytelling has to reveal to people the mechanism by which the discrimination took place as, um, and that means you're going to be telling a bunch of stories about history and that is just life, like life in the racial justice fast lane. You learn a lot of history and you learn to tell these stories with a historical component in like two minutes. Um, so, so storytelling, not over reliance on data, using data to enhance your story rather than expecting the data itself to like tell the story. That's a set of skills that are important. Um, and I also, I'm going to note that I did say uh, it makes things better for vulnerable white people. And so that's, you know, the Oakland Hills, maybe racial justice beyond like making, I mean, there are arguments you can make. Society. Stronger society, public safety, I think, is a huge racial justice issue. Um, um, being, being a cohesive community, those are all arguments you can make. But you're not going to get everybody. And at a certain point, you just have to out-organize um, the naysayers. Al yeah, although also, Dwayne has a better no, idea. No, I just also think that the important disconnect that happens often is, uh, is managers of systems. Uh, we, and I'll say we collectively think, OK, our system's not intentionally discriminating, and it hasn't for a long time, and so it's really going to be OK. But the fact that these systems initiated with discriminatory acts or often had deep historical roots, there's a momentum that will continue, and right. racial inequity will protect, perpetuate unless we counter it. It's not going to stop and peter out on its own. Yeah. I think that's, that's an important thing for decision makers and leaders to re recognize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, making the case for equity conscious decision making rather than colorblind decision making. So join me in welcoming, thanking, thank you, sir.